Welcome to the Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship located on occupied ancestral land of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Housing the building constructed by three formerly enslaved African Americans. My name is Richard Shelby and I'll be assisting today. <clears throat> if this is your first time here or your 101st first time, we're glad you are here. If you carry the weight of a weary world on your shoulders, or you enter through the door with a song in your heart and a skip in your step, we are glad you are here. If you have failed once or a thousand times, we are glad you are here. If you sing like angels or mumble behind the hymnal, <laughs> we are glad you are here. This community is what it is because of your presence. So welcome. Welcome into this space of love, support, justice, compassion, fellowship, and worship. On behalf of the members of the fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all visitors who are joining us for the first time and to those of you who still feel like visitors. If you have not already done so, please fill out the digital visitor card by visiting auuf.org visitor so that we may welcome you. You may also contact our minister, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, at minister at a with any questions or concerns you may have. Let us move into the service willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Our opening words this morning are from Mary Frances Comer. We are grateful to mark time with seasons, to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, or to gather as a family, to remember as loved ones. In all these seasons, let us give thanks for the breath of life, ever mindful of the fragile nature of existence. May we live fully in each moment, from summer to fall and winter to spring. We gather in mystery and in the bonds of the beloved community. May we radiate love, both within and beyond these walls, this day and all the days to come, caring for those we love and for those we have yet to meet. our chalice this morning with these words from Kevin Yago. <clears throat> when the candle dims, the wax almost spent, the light turns amber like a sunset. Still it provides a light, still it provides heat, still it can kindle new flame and cast it glow on and contribute to new illumination. When sunsets turn to new days, when seasons transform all, when the candle dims, all is not lost, hope continues. 
uncertain and true, like candlelight, ready to spark again, all is not lost. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families separated at our southern border. you to rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn number 123 in the great hymnal, Spirit of Life. joy concern the milestone in the YouTube chat box during music and meditation. We invite those in person to one at a time drop the pebble in our communal bowl during music and meditation. Spoken joys and concerns will be invited following the music. you have a joy, concern, or milestone to come forward. Line up briefly to help maintain social distances. Please come forward after the last person has left the market. So, so often when I get up here, I have to tell you bad news. So I'm very happy to have some good news for you all this morning. In case you haven't checked your email yet this morning, Sam and Ressica announced the birth of their baby boy, Rowan, on July 27th. And one advantage, if you haven't signed up for the listserv yet, is if you had signed up for the listserv, there would be pictures of this little baby boy in your email right now. So go sign up for the email if you haven't. <laughs> I guess both joy and concern. Um, last weekend, I uh, got into a car accident. Uh, totaled the vehicle, but thankfully, everyone uh, came out okay, and uh, insurance is covering everything, so very thankful to be safe uh, after a dangerous moment. I have a 
Joy, my grandson, was valedictorian of his eighth grade class this year. He's a smart boy. I'm celebrating a milestone. I have started the process of going through all the stuff I've collected since I've been like born. <laughs> May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community grow shared aloud and those held in silence be received into the care and concern of all present. <clears throat> now the moment for all ages, Hal and Gail celebrate Luminosa. Luminosa. <laughs> Lunasa by Andrea Flores. Today, my brother and I get to play outside all day at Victus's Lunasa. Lunasa is my mommy's favorite summer holiday. She says that's because it's so close to her birthday, but I think it's because of all the wonderful loaves of bread she bakes. I can smell the fresh bread all through. My brother Howell and I zoom through the yard pretending we are airplanes. I love Lunasa because it's so warm and I get to wear my pretty dresses. Howell loves Lunasa because we can play with the sprinklers. <laughs> Kids, time to come for our song, Mommy yells outside. Yay, me and Howell shout together. The song means it's almost time for our Lunasa feast and Mommy makes them. Best feast. <laughs> we sit around the table with our family. Our auntie, uncle, and cousin Nalia come to celebrate our feast. My mommy starts our Lunasa song and everyone joins in. Harvest season comes again. We thank the world for all it brings, from tiny seed to full grown grain. May we also grow this way. And then we take turns saying our favorite harvest goddess or god out loud to the group. Howell and I love this part because we both get to shout as loud as we can. Look, shouts, Howell shouts, That's easy, I pout, and not fair because his name is the same as the holiday. Gail, look, look is a perfectly good choice for this holiday, mommy reminds me. Why don't you tell us yours? Mine is never, Mama, because you said they love the grain. Mommy and Daddy were proud of my answer, and they said it was their favorite, too. <laughs> then it was Uncle, Auntie, and Nalia's turn, and they said Demeter, because she loves the harvest, too. Then we finally get to eat the great food Mommy made. Yum, yum, yum. I love the food, also. Here's the grain. And today, I brought corn husks. Do you know what a corn husk is? You know like when you get an ear of corn and it's got the green stuff on the outside, you gotta peel it off so you can eat the corn on the inside? When you let those dry out, you can make dollies out of those. And so, if you want. Mama, is it too heavy and the corn will pop badly there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not gonna pop any popcorn, but that is exactly correct. Musician in the making.
Please join me in the spirit of contemplation in whatever way feels right with these words from Stephen M. Schick. Early spring awakened memories of a deeper cold and hopes of a warmer wetness, sprouting seeds and building the branches, gray trees on gray skies, screen eyes from all that lies waiting, the color of a million flowers, the feathers of migrating songbirds, the blossoming smiles of friends. Soon we will no longer look to the night stars to guide us. Soon the path will be lit and our task certain. In these warming days, though, we have planted our future, uprooted useless skeletons of last year's harvest, breaking the clods of indifference, carefully pulling the weeds of neglect so that the roots can stretch. Before the harvest moon rises, we will wait again. Images of still distant summer days awaken thoughts of a time when all is done that can be done. Then the harvest, then the transformation, then the breaking, then the bread. All we know and love is in this cycle. All that has been or will be is in our gifts. Take them, break them, and give thanks. This religious community exists by its mission as a fire exists by burning. But a fire cannot burn without fuel. And it is time, the energy, the imagination, the vision, the creativity, the compassion, the love, and the financial support of the members and friends of this community that fuels our mission to nurture and sustain a welcoming, inclusive, and diverse liberal religious community that transforms lives and serves the world. Your support, the free and generous support of each and every member and friend of this community is what fuels this community and its mission. And without your support, the flame of justice, community, and love cannot burn brightly to warm ourselves and be a beacon in a world threatened by division and fear. To make a division on donation online via PayPal, please visit auf.org slash donate Please indicate in the notes where your donation is for the pledge or the offering. If you are writing a check, please make your check payable to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge. And mail it to P.O. Box 669, Auburn, Alabama 36831. The offering will now be greatly received.
technology. With NASA, the night before August 2nd, or the point between summer solstice and fall equinox, or full moon of August. Lunasa marks the fourth and last of the Celtic year's great feasts. It marks the beginning of the time of ripening, the last moment of rest before summer's balm turns into fall's labor. In Erin, it marked the year's greatest gatherings and fairs, with every clan met in peace. Agriculturally, Lunasa is the time of ripening fruits and nuts, when the land begins to give forth its bounty. The labor of planting and tending, young shoots is ended. The labor of harvesting and laying up lies ahead. The corn stands high, nearly ripe, but prey to storm and crushing hail. With the crops in the late fate's hands, the folk gather to take their care, their ease, and pray for a good harvest. Lunasa translates as the wedding feast of Lu, the young hero is wed to the holy land to protect it from the perils of the storm until the harvest. Lunasa's myth mythic patterns center around the young god Lu, whose name means light. He is an example of the Celtic motif of the young sun born magically of the union between the gods and the giants. He is welcome in the hall of the god because he is a master of every skill and the slayer of Balor the sorcerer king of Fomors, opponents of the gods. He wields the spear of victory that never misses its mark. Lu is welcomed into the family of the gods and goddesses and becomes champion of the gods, perhaps replacing Ohem and the tannished heir apparent, replacing Angus Og as a protector and defender against ill. He is invoked in this season to protect the growing crops from storm and blight. The modern holy day Lusan Lunasa is perhaps the most agricultural of four Celtic feasts. It is celebrated as first harvest and offerings are made to protect the crops. It is the time for hand fastings and contracts. As the god of light is wed to the goddess of the land, loaves of bread are blessed and offered, along with beer and the symbol of the spear of victory. to Richard for looking up all those names. He didn't ask me a single one of them. <laughs> <clears throat> so this year I've been taking us on a little bit of an experiment that some of you have noticed and others may not have. The ancient European festivals that are still celebrated by many today, I believe give a good grounding to remind us of the changing of the year, of the different seasons of life, and remind us of values to be open to. With Lunasad Day, we will have gone through all eight of the festivals, and I bet some of you didn't even realize we went through them all. <laughs> Lunasa is an interesting one, too. Because I remember as a kid looking through the calendar and noticing that most months had at least one holiday where I got a day off from school. <laughs> September at Labor Day, October, Halloween, November, Thanksgiving, December, Christmas, and so on and so forth. But why didn't August have a single darn day where I got off from school? Why, did I, why was it the only day that I had to go to school on all the weekdays? I think about the, back to this in a little bit of jest now, because I really wanted to be out of school, to go out and play and enjoy the warm weather, enjoy it while it lasted. Because if you've ever been to the southern Indiana region that I come from, you'll know that the seasons can be quite unpredictable. 
Although it's rare, I do remember September's and October's with snow. So August could be the last time you see truly warm weather. In fact, by Halloween, when all the kids are supposed to dress up in their cheap plastic costumes from Walmart, my mother used to put as many layers underneath those things as possible because otherwise, how would I even trick or treat? But Lunasaw reminds us that we're not there yet. Lunasaw reminds us that there is still light. As you heard from the reading that Richard just read, Lunasaw was a harvest festival. In Celtic origin, it was named after Lu, the Irish god of sun and light. And it was symbolic of the bounty that the sun had planted. Halfway between the summer solstice and the autumn equinox, the sun was still dominating. But we were looking forward to the cold yet to come. Fruits such as apples and grapes were ripening already, and calves were being weaned. And in fact, in some Irish counties, farmers waited until Lunasaw to pick fruits for fear of bad luck that if they picked them too early, these fruits would bring bad luck to their family and their clan. What you have to understand, though, about Lunasaw is it was more than just good food. It was an entire celebration. There were games and contests in honor of Lou, who was also a craftsman god, and a general atmosphere of celebrations for all the blessings that abound. Now it could be easy to pass this off as just a Celtic tradition if it wasn't for the fact that virtually every culture in Europe had some sort of celebration, holiday, right around August 1st. There is something about that time of year for people that it was a time to celebrate the summer's bounty was coming in. They would survive the coming winter because of their hard work. And in fact, it was so universal that when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, they outlawed Lunasaw. They outlawed the celebration, but they mysteriously created a new holiday called Lamas on the same day, which literally means Loaf Mass Day, which happens to fall on August 1st. Imagine that. In Lamas, it was a way to continue celebrating the first fruits without the pagan overtones that many of the new Christian masters of the lands objected to. And if we still celebrated Lamas today, all of you would have baked bread last night and brought it to church this morning. <laughs> because that was the tradition that everyone would break, would bake a loaf of bread and bring it in. Now there's a lot that I could say about Lunasaw and Lamas, but for me, the importance of the two holidays are remembering the first fruits. Much of the harvest in ancient times wouldn't come to ripen until later in the fall towards autumn equinox, but it was a time to stop and reflect on what had already come to pass roughly halfway into the calendar year. An opportunity to remember that we're all interdependent, that we all need each other, and a chance to celebrate at the end of summer. It's a reminder that though the winter was hard and the spring might have brought hard, might have brought famine, that the circle of life swung back towards bounty, 
affords enough for everyone. It's easy to forget the first fruits, right? It's easy to forget when those things are coming to pass. I was talking just yesterday to a woman who was an artist. She often uses techniques very similar to automatic writing where she just goes into a sort of a trance-like state and paints, and by the time she's done, she doesn't even recognize what she created. She just sees the final product and didn't see those first fruits. And yet, without that first brush, without that first bit of color, the final painting would have never come about. Things are constantly changing. And by the time we realize it, the things we care about may even already be but a memory. It's easy to forget how many things come into our lives constantly. In fact, I find myself this Lunas remembering my mother. My mother, I've told several of you, but my mother baked everything except bread. I don't, I know, never really understood why that was the one thing that she was not keen on baking. But I still think she would have enjoyed this holiday. I think she would have baked a bunch of things, and maybe even celebrated the other first fruits that were coming into her life. I think it helps to have a structured time because even though first fruits, even though August is a relatively arbitrary time based on our view of the calendar system, to reflect on the first fruits, doesn't it still help to have a time when we can reflect on the things coming into our lives? To remind us to recognize the first fruits throughout the rest of the year, to celebrate the ripening and rededicate ourselves to whatever it is that may be coming to pass, and an opportunity to celebrate our wins with others. Most of us aren't sustenance farmers in this room. In fact, I'm looking around at you all, and I'm not sure any of you are sustenance farmers. But yet, even in a non-agricultural part, even in a non-agricultural society, such as we live in, there are still first fruits. I had the honor of announcing one of them during Joys and Concerns. There's a new baby in our community. When I put out an email message this week asking if you all might share some of your first fruits, a couple of you did respond and tell me what your first fruits are. And I did hear everything from babies coming up to promotions to some type of intellectual um, endeavor bearing fruit, such as a poetry book. And indeed, family milestones can be first fruits. New jobs, changes in jobs, new housing, works of art, works of poetry, works of fiction and nonfiction can all be first fruits. It's what is coming to pass in your life that has meaning for you, just as those early Europeans had meaning in the harvest that would sustain them for the winter. So it's had me reflecting on what are our first fruits this year. We have had setbacks. I won't deny that. 
but I'm really proud of the programs we're working on together here in the fellowship. On adult RE, on social justice outreach, on children's RE, on continuing to iron out the wrinkles in our internet, the possibilities of new partnerships in the community, and indeed, I couldn't help but notice that while I was gone this month, y'all didn't wait for me to gather together and decide what you should do about Roe versus Wade being repealed. Y'all didn't say, oh, we'll wait for Reverend Chris to get back. I was saying all the messages while I was gone. Where are you right now? Where is our community right now? And that's what I'm going to ask you to reflect on this morning. What is ripening in your life? What do you have to celebrate with us? And what do you hope to continue to bloom in the second half of the year? I asked all of you to consider bringing something that was ripening, either to share with us verbally, because I understand as much as we would love to see the baby, it might be hard if the new baby is in the life to bring and share that with everyone. Or to share with us audibly, such as a piece of music or a poem you may have been working on. And indeed, a couple of you noticed this. I brought something. Because Calvin's getting too much of a reputation as being the only one in my household who can cook. <laughs> so, I brought a homemade apple pie oh, to share with you all that I hope my mother would be proud of. <laughs> and it will be on the table during coffee hour. Please help me eat it. We already have another one at home. <laughs> So it's never too late. Don't focus on what was taken away. Find something to replace it and acknowledge the blessings you have. And the spirit of being us is to notice what is blossoming in our lives. What if we expanded to noticing what's not ripening as well and work on that? And I think that this could be a reminder to notice our blessings throughout the year. When you're down, it's not to say that there are things in your life going wrong. Because I do still worry about the financial situation of our congregation. I do still worry about the things that aren't going right. And at the same time, there is so much to celebrate as well. Remember to celebrate your wins as much as your losses. And remember, the circle of life circles back to life every time. And I'm not going to sing the Elton John song for you this morning. <laughs> but may it be so. Now, it's your turn. I shared with you all my first fruits. I want to invite you to come up and share with us what are your first fruits? What is blooming in your life right now that you would like to share with us, either as a story or as an offering that you can give us right now? So I'd like to invite you to come up to the microphone as you are willing and able and tell us what is it that you can share with us this morning? Well, we said if you're going to be nervous about something, get up there as fast as you can. <laughs> now, I had my first job delivering newspapers by bicycle uh, in junior high. 55 years later, on August 1st, 2015, was my first day of retirement. My, my milestone um, 
it's really difficult to go through all your stuff that you've collected all of your life and make decisions about it. That's the hardest part, is making the decision. And I've been doing this since April 1st. And I'm, I'm not done. <laughs> but I have moved everything out of my rental house back to my house, so I can rent the rental house. But that's a huge milestone. But it's a fruit because I am now in that process of sorting and deciding and I have to continue this, and I imagine it'll be like, I don't know, another five or six years before I can like get back to a stasis of where most people live. <laughs> <laughs> when we moved on to um, the property we're living on now, a couple of years ago, I found out that there was a mature brown turkey fig tree in the yard. And if I had gotten the memo, about first fruits today, I'd have brought you all a box of those figs. So I'll, I'll make it happen next week. <laughs> well, I thought I would share some recent art. Um, this, this is a 1040 form. And, and so it became the basis of this work. And I was like, should it be this way? Should it be this way? But uh, it can be any way you like. But it's got these wonderful little gears that kind of work in with the serpent, and it just all makes this complete form 1040. <laughs> <coughs> As an agricultural holiday, um, the one with silver in a which I can't pronounce, pronunciate. Lunas. Lunas. Lunas mm -hmm. yep. um, is uh, not quite appropriate for here. That my in-laws always used to basically close down the garden in August, <laughs> um, and that was for, for travel time. We, in fact, are still harvesting cucumbers, ganadoru, set of corn in. Still got tomatoes coming in, um, but. August really does seem to be sort of the end of the growing season, even, even as we're extending it. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting that we sort of institutionalize something uh, uh, that, that fits where it came from, and maybe not so much where we are, but the important thing is the institution more than the date. talking for just 50 minutes at the class. Uh, <laughs> if you could just give me two minutes, I'll talk about my second book, which came out um, and it's shining. I was just pulling off the plastic just now. So. Um, Indiana University Press. What's the name of the book? It's, um, thank you. It's, um, it's named, uh, it's a biography. So the name is after uh, the person that it focuses on. So it's um, a woman who, um, I'll just tell you why she was famous. Um, she was married to what they used to call the robber barons, mm. that is the great industrial, great, I should say great, great in quotes, industrialists of the late 19th century who funded and built the railroads, the um, uh, industry, industrial sites, the um, ports, uh, and all the infrastructure of American industrialization. And so she was married to a guy called Russell Sage, who was actually the kind of right hand man of Jay Gould, who was one of those um, really notorious. Um, guys of the Gilded Age. Um, I went to their house. I've got tenure before I did this book because I thought I needed a lot of time to write about women, and so I did it so heavy I could hardly bring it in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did a really nice job, and I wanted to kind of, um, I'll pass it around actually. No, no time Great. to read, I'll just pass it around. But um, I wanted to kind of look into the myth of the Victorian woman sitting, you know, in her crinoline, sitting on a sitting on a stool and you're sewing all the time. Um, and that, of course, is totally only true for a tiny elite of people. You had enslaved women picking up cotton. You had enslaved women harvesting wheat and other 
crops, and many, many women laboring in factories and, um, and all kinds of retail, and also just beginning to get into white collar work until about 1900. Um, I'm a historian, I can't help dates. <laughs> Have to anchor it in time. So um, anyway, so I thought, what did she do? Well, her and nothing. Nobody knew a thing about her. Nothing written on her whatsoever. And uh, this was very intriguing. So I went to everybody's greatest um, source of knowledge, which was the RDV Libraries, um, New York Times Index, Index of Obituaries. A great read on a wet afternoon, I tell you. And uh, <laughs> so I was looking for her last name, Sage. She always went under her husband's name, and she always um, did everything in his name, although he was one of the stingiest misers um, that was there, very, very, very wealthy. He spent very little on charity or philanthropy at all. And they used to say he even bought an apple to work in, on Wall Street so that he wouldn't have to go and buy lunch. Anyway, um, is this too echoey? No, you're good. Okay, get up and leave if it's too echoey. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, I discovered she gave everything away after he died. So she, luckily he was 12 years older than she was. So when he died, she was in her mid, early 80s. And uh, she started to spend it. She had all of these ideas about spending um, her money on what she saw as good deeds, good things. Daryl's read the book, so he's nodding. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's I watched the, the TV show. He's read the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so she thought, she had some ideas that we would think were, were very, very quixotic or foolish or wrong, like a, a plan for converting the Muslim world to Christianity, which didn't work out too well, and, um, <laughs> and printing the Bible in, in uh, Cairo and, and printing presses. But she also did an awful lot for animal welfare, Sally, it's a good thing. And um, she um, paid for um, hospitals for um, hospitals and ambulances for, uh, in New York City and New York State uh, for animals that were hurt and lots and lots of money and she was very, very fed up with fashion because fashion, um, which said that women should wear lots of enormous, wonderful, exotic feathers on their hats, she thought she knew that because of this, tropical birds were being wiped out, so she, she can less so she, by this time she got so controversial that the press put in all kinds of stuff that she, she did. She also wanted women to vote because she said women now are in all kinds of jobs. They're in banks, they're in businesses, they're teaching in women-only universities. They're nursing in women-only hospitals. They're doctors in women-only hospitals because it would be most unfitting to have a man examine a woman patient. And so women were getting into all these professions that of course have blossomed in our own time um, only to be um, stamped down again as much as it could be done. But anyway, so uh, she spent actually half a billion dollars on philanthropy, and that's in 1918 money. So her dates and 1828 to 1918, when she died, then she left all that money, and particularly to education, she left um, 600,000 to each of 18 universities. But you know, for, for the 18, 19 years of her life, she had been going on and on about women's education and why women deserve education, why women deserve the bow, the bow they deserve this, that, and the other. Unfortunately though, if you read that will, she's giving to Harvard, to Princeton, to Yale, and so uh, an interesting part of the research was me going to these university archives at, at Princeton and Yale and so on, and reading the correspondence of the fundraisers as they wrote to her, and um, they wrote things like, well, we have just erected a statue to your colonial era ancestor, who was, of course, um, Rector of Yale in 16 something or other, would you not now like to give a large, generous donation? So on and so forth. Then they were, then they wrote to, then he wrote to the Harvard one saying, "Quick, while she's in the mood, get her while she's in her summer house. She's not protected by her, her staff, and you can get her, and you can get her to give um, to any institution that you that you like." So sometimes that was successful, and I need to wind up. So anyway, I did find it interesting, and it took me into a rather controversial area about gifting and philanthropy, and whether, whether philanthropy is a form of exercise of power over people, or whether it's an exercise of pure generosity and love for people or institutions and so on. I'll leave that to, for you to figure out. Um, well, thank you for listening, and um, I do have the longer version anytime you've got two hours to spare. <laughs> <laughs> buy the book, buy the book. Yes. Indiana University Press is online. It's um, probably reduced now. Um, I think the long lines of the 
weird. But, <laughs> one piece, there was actually no, if I may say the word, there was actually no sex in it that I could get into this book. But I, oh, but I did try, because I found that for um, about 30 years, she volunteered in a women's hospital in New York City. In those days, as I said, the medicine was segregated by sex. But she was one of the lady volunteers that went along and, uh, and volunteered, um, kind of saw that everybody was behaving themselves, I think. I'm not sure quite what she did, but the minutes of that hospital were fascinating to look at. Um, it's at Columbia, just next to Columbia University in New York City. And they go up about four or five flights of stairs, and then there's the archives of the hospital going right back to 1856 when it was founded by, you know, somebody nodding, get me, give me a, encouraging nod, no, she's not, okay. <laughs> um, founded by a group of uh, ladies, so-called benevolent ladies, with time on their hands, and with servants, of course, at home, so they didn't need to sit home and do the potatoes or make apple pies or anything like that. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Bye, the book. One of the uh, early fruits in my life has been um, a friendship. Um, uh, Taylor and I have, over the last like many months, sort of started building an intentional friendship, and it's been really nice to have someone consistently in my life that we've both communicated, you know, what we're looking for from one another. We're clear, and um, you know, he, he's been. Awesome, um, and it just occurred to me as I was sitting trying to think of like you know what's already here now because I'm still thinking about like what's coming up. Uh, I was like, oh, um, yeah, this friendship has been uh, really great as it's grown and developed and changed, and um, yeah, I wanted to share that. with our daughter and it's just a very exciting first fruit. I hope this will encourage everyone to recognize and remember their own first fruits when they do see them. Um, Carl brought up an interesting point about um, institutionalizing the traditions of a culture where we might not have the same seasons as them. And that's an interesting question and Alan Warren and I was talking to someone about that the other day and they said that <laughs> they used to live in northern Canada talk about Northern Canada and not talking about Edmonton. I'm talking about the Northwest Territories <laughs> where it was so cold most of the year that they couldn't have survived on agriculture even if they wanted to. And he said he's, and he made a point that he's fully in favor of us um, finding ways of celebrating these things throughout the whole year because it's really not about the time of year, it's about remembering the first fruits and remembering to celebrate them in our lives. And so whatever time of year it is, even in the dark of winter or the highest summer, remember there are things blooming in your life that are important. Remember to shed them. I would like to invite you to join us in body or in spirit for our closing hymn number 69 in the gray hymnal, We Give Thanks.
please join us in extinguishing our chalice. We will find the words in your order of service. We extinguish this flame for the lack of light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please be our guest today after the service for coffee hour outside in the bush zone. Insight, right here. <laughs> and pie. Yeah. And pie. You can find the information. Uh, if you are signed up, uh, <clears throat> if you are not signed up for our email list, please make sure to do so to receive updates about ways to connect. You can find information on signing up on our website, auuf.org slash subscribe. I invite anyone with spoken announcements to come forward at this time. So um, I had such an enthusiastic response from it last year that uh, next week I'm bringing back the question box service. Oh. And the idea behind this is my entire sermon will be questions for you all. It could be a question about something that I've said or something I haven't said. Maybe I haven't brought up something and you're curious what I'm thinking about it. I can't guarantee you that every question will be answered, but every question will be considered. So um, watch your email, you, and I'll send you instructions on how to submit a question. And I promise that they will not, that I will not give your name unless you ask me to. So you, I'll know who you are, but no one else will. Um, also, uh, be, uh, we're, I sent out some emails in the past couple of weeks about adult RE uh, for the fall. I would like to invite everyone to join us in those offerings, including covenant groups, group spiritual direction, um, a spiritual practices group, and a group on how to craft lay services. If you'd like to do what the Sunday Services Committee does, you can learn all about how we do that. So um, if you can't find those emails or if you have questions, email me. Also, if you have an idea for an RE group, for an RE program you would like to facilitate, that um, please be sure to contact myself or Chris Baskier. We would love to have a diversity of groups in our fellowship. two things. One is the Equal Exchange uh, Market. We have a permanent home set up right over there. That little cabinet there has all our fair trade goods and it can be accessed anytime at all. So if you come on Sunday and want to pick up some coffee, chocolate, etc., you can do so. If you come at choir practice or Saturday morning meditation and want to grab something, feel free. Uh, we do not keep cash in the building for safety, so if you pick up something while someone's not here, just write a little IOU on the paper we'll have out. And uh, everything that's there now is from pre-COVID times. Maybe not the freshest in the world, so we just want it gone. If you can take something <laughs> home with you, that's great. If you want to leave a donation, even better. Um, and we'll be looking at what to order fresh going forward. Um, there will be chocolate on order come fall once the heat drops down. Um, so yeah, so that's there. Um, Question. Yes. Would, would you like to have a list if people have a special request of what they're looking for? Yes, to definitely. Um, we're not going to just order and guess about what you want. So I will soon have a list of what products are available to order through Equal Exchange. Um, and for those not familiar, this is uh, fair trade, responsibly sourced stuff where we, the group, uh, the organization works with small farmers to get their goods sold. And everyone involved in the process is getting fairly compensated for their contribution. Um, so we will, if you want something ordered, please let me know. I'll get a sheet of paper out there where you can write down what you're looking for and I'll show you what they have available. Um, and when enough people want to buy a thing, we'll order the thing then and not sooner. Um, so that's that. Um, thing number two, 
is this Saturday is our RE work party. Um, so we are working to get the <coughs> RE building ready for this next coming year of uh, programming. And part of that is going to include getting rid of some old stuff. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot that's accumulated over the years. So if you'd like to help us clear out, that would be lovely. There's also likely to be some, you know, minor repair work, who knows what else. Um, and as always, we will have coffee and donuts to entice you out here. Uh, that's all I got, thanks. What time is the question? And I'll check with Angela and get back to you probably eight, maybe nine. I'm going to make the announcement that um, August 14th is our in-gathering. There's old in-gathering photos. When you show up, there'll be a new photo taken. Um, and also, it's potluck Sunday that day. I'll be the cleanup angel. But I also want to put out that um, don't forget to go to the AACP Hands on a Hard Body. It's up, it's, the show opens on the 5th, uh, and on the 6th is Pay What You Can Night. And Carter DeShazzo is in this pr production, and it's a musical, and it should be really fun. And then it goes into the next weekend, which is also ends on August 14th. So, there you go. Please join us now for our song of benediction. is by Eric Williams. May the firmness of the earth be yours. May the flow of the water be yours. May the freedom of the air be yours. May the fierceness of the fire be yours. May all of the gifts of this life, the below and the above, be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Blessed be. Go in peace and please eat some pie. <laughs>